Last week, we talked about standards and how they are only as good as both the people setting them and the subject's willingness to abide by them. After all, Chamberlain was certain he had a guarantee of peace in our time from Hitler. But the dictator was not impressed by Chamberlain's standard of peace, and so he sought his own, which actually involved a great deal of war. This week, I'd like to focus on a seldom lauded concept that ought to be more universally embraced. Failure. Failure, I hear you say. Who wants that? I get it. In school, we all accepted that failure is bad. That was the acknowledged opinion. In this episode, I'd like to examine this philosophical position and offer a different approach instead. In school, we experience the paradigm of the teacher at the head of the class lecturing to a room full of students who we expect to see diligently taking notes. We've discussed the psychological shift that raising a hand makes in the learning hypothesis, reinforcing that to be allowed to speak, one must first ask permission, that it obliges a person who desires to contribute to first draw all attention to himself, and that it preempts the organic exchange of information and thoughts that we ought to be seeking in our educational endeavors. Now, add to that the increased pressure on the students to perform without failure, the ridicule that comes from being wrong after attempting an answer or for asking a stupid question. We all know that when the teacher says, there are no stupid questions, well, that's a lie because there are actually dumb questions, questions that have nothing to do with the topic perhaps, or questions for which the answer has just been spoken. Uh, maybe it's blatantly obvious. And saying that stupid questions don't exist, it betrays the trust between the teacher and the students, and it, it further cements that relationship of knower and unknower. In other words, that learning is a one-way street. Knowledge flows in one direction. And finally, the teacher cannot be wrong because he is the knower and the student must necessarily sit patiently waiting for the spigot of knowledge to disgorge information. It also changes learning into a consumption sport. I remember the day I learned in Swedish how to say the phrase, it isn't necessary. Det behövs inte. For me, it was an entirely new construction. This phrase translates literally to, it is needed not, which arguably is weird in English, but in Swedish, it makes complete sense. And in fact, is a very common saying. It could also be translated as, oh, don't bother, or don't worry about it. But the day I learned that, I got it from a conversation I was having with a classmate. Someone else came over to offer to drive her somewhere, and she said, Nej, tack. Det behövs inte. I knew she didn't need a ride, so I understood her meaning, and at the same time, Eureka! I figured out how to form passive voice in Swedish verbs. I learned from her, even though she wasn't teaching me. She wasn't even talking to me. Once I learned that adding the S to the end of the verb, behöver, to make behövs was the way to form the passive voice construct. Did I know it? Mm, not quite. I needed to use it more than once, actually to really know it. I probably failed a few times trying to use it correctly. That's why in the classical curriculum, we talk about the dialectic. Watching someone perform something like repairing a refrigerator, and fixing it yourself are two very different things. Knowing how to fix the fridge takes having done it a few times. Watching an experiment in a video is only the palest version of doing the experiment yourself. Instead of requiring a student to 
try on the lab coat and get her hands dirty, school imposes on her the knowledge from a lecturing professor, or worse, from a video. She internalizes a, a bigger message. There is no debate. There are few to no questions. There's no discussion. There is only the expert imparting his word. And there is an arbiter of right and wrong, success or failure. And you don't want to be wrong. And you don't, for any reason, want to fail. I asked a few successful people what they thought of when I said the word failure. These are all individuals with perseverance and tenacity who have achieved great heights in their chosen professions. The first one immediately said, failure was the best way to learn. It was the greatest teacher. For instance, are you aware that Thomas Edison's first 10,000 attempts to create the light bulb failed? When asked how it felt to fail so much, he replied, I didn't fail 10,000 times. The light bulb was an invention with 10,000 steps. For him, it seems failure was simply a directive to do better next time. That's an important lesson to learn from the guy who invented the light bulb. Edison was completely deaf in one ear and could barely hear out of the other. He attributed his tremendous brain power and focus to his deafness, preventing him from being distracted. Now, how should we consider his failure to hear properly? As a handicap or as an advantage? Abe Lincoln also was a failure by many metrics. He ran seven times for office and failed every time until, well, the eighth one was the charm when he ascended to the presidency of the United States of America and ended slavery. Supposedly, more books have been written about him than anyone else save Jesus Christ. Imagine if he were to have given up because of feeling that failure was a signal to quit. Learning should be interactive, like tennis. When someone lobs some information your way, you should get in the game and hit it back with an idea of what it means to you. Students can learn more from people who know more, but those experts should also learn from their students or they aren't truly engaged. They are just reciting information. School teachers and professors tend to be like automatic ball machines, and you might be able to practice your game. Yes, but you're not really learning how to play tennis. You're learning rudimentary strokes, perhaps, but only if you're analyzing your play afterward. And if not, or you don't have a coach guiding you on the things you're doing wrong, you're just cementing bad habits. I had a coach once say to me, practice doesn't make perfect, Sam. Practice only makes permanent. There may be teachers in your local school who are exceptional at connecting with kids and engaging them, inspiring them to learn. But how much can they pour into each student? And every student they focus on means the other children get less from them. It is a tough equation. But your child is in competition with all the other children in a classroom, at least for attention, focus, and connection. And by the way, we have all but eliminated debate in our classrooms, perhaps so that the teachers won't be challenged. But that is not the nature of life, nor is it the nature of a free society. It is a faulty paradigm that produces young people who think they are educated, but who lack the capacity to reason and argue their point. But what did you think the college safe zones and segregated free speech zones were really about. They are designed for young people who cannot tolerate 
having strange notions in their heads challenged. They are for young people who cannot tolerate having the strange notions in their heads challenged, whether by data or truth or simply by life itself, by someone disagreeing with them. I was recently tutoring a young woman in algebra. She attended a Christian school nearby, so I would go to the school and sit with her during her study hall period to go over problems and provide support where I could. I needed, however, to see her tests to really determine where she was failing. 